Let's sing it together. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house. of the Lord forever I will sing all the mercies of the Lord with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness thy faithfulness with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations I will sing of the Lord forever I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness with my mouth. of the Lord forever I will sing I will sing I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing of the mercies of the Lord I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart I will enter his courts with praise I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the way that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. And be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord. One more time. Here we go. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that 
from the past choruses. That was good. That's okay, it. great. I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Love, how can it be 
when you are filled with the Spirit. We are purified. We are cleansed. There are several verses here. We are purified and we are cleansed. The impurities of our life, the pollution that we were born with, the corruption. We, are, we were born with a corrupt heart because of this nature of sin. We are purified of all that. Now, you couldn't do anything to get rid of that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Impurities, pollution, corruption that the sin nature has infected us with. Okay, Acts 15, 8 and 9. We mentioned this last week. Let's read this one together. I know if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. It might be a good thing to underline. But, but this is, let's read it together. God knows all people's hearts. Now, let's just stop right there because as the, Luke was writing this, he wanted everyone to know, whether they were Jew or Gentile, that he, this first phrase was more important than anything else. God knows all people's hearts. Okay, let's go on, read together. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts by faith. It's 1 John, yes, 1-7. If we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I don't know how 
anyone could look at what the Bible is saying and still say, I don't need this. Once you've been shown the light, and this is a part of being born again, and we, we, we know that Jesus, through his spirit, speaks to us about things that we should do, the things that we shouldn't do, and trying to be obedient and follow the will of God. But it's, it's hard for me to think that as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, that you could think that this is just something that you don't have to experience. As long as you know Jesus, everything's okay. And when somebody, and you read it in the scripture, or somebody teaches, or, or somebody testifies about it, and all of a sudden you hear that you don't have to live with this nature, and you say, I don't need this. I'm not sure if I believe it. And you walk away from it. You have made a moral decision to not listen to God through his Holy Spirit. And he says to you, I want to free you from this. Just like the disciples didn't know what all was going to happen until they were, you know, the Pentecost when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't know. Jesus just said, go to wait for Jerusalem. He taught them about the Holy Spirit, but he didn't tell them what all was going to happen. They didn't know that there was going to be a mighty wind that came rushing through where they were at. They didn't know that they were going to see cloven tongues of fire. They didn't know that they were going to be purified with those tongues of fire. They didn't know they were going to be speaking other languages to people from around the world about the mighty things of God. They didn't know any of that. And the apostle Peter finally says in Acts, the main thing is the main thing that Cornelius accepted this infilling, this filling of the Holy Spirit in his life just as we experienced it in the upper room. The fact is that God's word says we can be cleansed of this self-centeredness, selfishness, self-absorption. James 4.8, James has a, a, a different way of talking about this. This is the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus. Come close to God and God will come close to you. That's a good one to remember. Wash your hands, you sinners. Now, why does James says you sinners? Because there is still something within the hearts of mankind, at least during James's time, that the message wasn't getting through that the Holy Spirit could turn a sinner into a saint. Because those who continue to sin, even though they believe in Jesus, are still sinning. And he wants them to know, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Now he says, purify, it's almost the understood you of English. You purify your hearts. Well, how can that be if we can't do it? Because he knows that there had to be an acknowledgement in the people's lives in order for them to come to the place where they finally say to the Lord, I know what my problem is now. Purify your heart. Go before the God, Almighty God, and say, Lord, I am struggling with being obedient to you. I don't want to do this. I want to be obedient. I want to live the way that will glorify your name and not be so involved with doing what I want to do. That's why the James is saying, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided. Purify by starting the process, starting the moment when we are we are sanctified and purified. By kneeling before the Lord and, and asking him, God, I need you. Help me. I want to be all yours. In fact, we could almost pray at that time, Lord, I want to be all yours or I don't want to be any of yours. We have such a passion to want to receive the Holy Spirit that it's either all or I don't want to live this life called a Christian because I know there's so much more. First, we are cleansed. Next, 
we are perfected. Oh boy, here we go. Pastor, you said we can't ever be perfect. We are perfected in one area of our life alone. I will never perform. It's probably a bad way to put it. I will never, my performance as a Christian, it's not an act. My life as a Christian, I will never always be perfect in how I act. That's not hard to believe. I will never be perfect in my wisdom. I'll never be perfect in my knowledge. I'll never be perfect in my body. Hmm. Not going to have the perfect hair. It's going anyway. Are we getting there, Jerry? You're trying. Bless your heart. So nice to have a co-pilot with me. So this perfection, Jesus says, is only of love. Matthew 5, 48 says, If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. This is in his Sermon on the Mount. But in verse 48, it says, But you are to be perfect. That word perfect is talking about the love that Jesus is talking about at the very top. If you love only those, that's not how God loves. You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. Now, when you know there's no one on earth that's ever going to be perfect like God, so you just kind of go by that and you say, well, that's crazy. You look for another translation, and all the translations all come back to either being complete or perfect. They mean the same thing. Jesus later on says in Matthew 27, 37 through 38, Teacher, well, this is verse 36, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses, Jesus says, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, but the second is like it. Equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The only way that you can ever really love God with all your heart, mind, and soul is to be empty of this nature of sin. To be empty of anything that corrupts your decision on as to whether you're going to follow the will of God or not follow the will of God. I will do everything I can, Lord, by being obedient to you. I will heed your word. I will follow you wherever that leads. You say, well, that's, that's pretty drastic to make that kind of a statement. And yet, so many people have followed that statement to their death have followed that statement not to, not, not to be uh, important or to be in headlines and, and not to have great success, but to follow Jesus to where Jesus wanted them to be, to be used by him. Be perfect in one area alone. This is the place where the transformation of the heart has made a complete healing. The experience of our inner nature from all of these hostilities, this hatred, this pride, this greed, these, all these carnal jealousies, to a condition of divine love for God and for others. That's the transformation. You say, it, well, why can't it happen all at the same time? It can. It can. God's not above doing anything. But usually, we're growing and maturing people from the moment that we accept Jesus. We, we take these steps, and we kind of learn, and we kind of grow, and we get into the Word a little bit more than we did before, and just all those things help us to grow. But there comes a moment when we are baptized, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, we called old-timers, used to call it entire sanctification. 
The entire got a lot of people messed up because entire meant all, everything. And, and entire sanctification just means that at that moment, this nature of sin was cleansed. There's nothing left except the Holy Spirit and you living in the same place without any rebelliousness. Sanctification, continued sanctification, continued maturity, continued progress in, the, in how we become a Christian. That, that makes us grow leaps and bounds when there isn't any, any conflict going on. Okay, the next one. Jerry, let's see if we can go here. We are empowered. The Holy Spirit is a person. And when his fullness is experienced, he empowers us to live, to think, to speak, and to take the message of full salvation to every community we live in. For every community we live in. Those disciples were empowered on the day of Pentecost. They were so empowered that God gave them the ability to tell other people in, in their own languages what was happening. And then, and then, by then, everybody was gathered together and people were saying, man, this, this, uh, these people are drunk. And Peter got up and said, we're not drunk. It's too early. This is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. This is the real deal. This is to tell you about the person of Jesus. This is to tell you what Jesus did. Remember the one that hung on the cross? Remember the one that, that, that went there and, and the nails were pierced into his hands and, and the sword was pierced into his side? That man, Jesus, he arose from the dead on the third day. And what you're seeing from all of these people that are speaking in your language, this, this is the Spirit of God that's reaching out to you to let you know that Jesus Christ is alive and He is the Savior of your lives. Acts 1.8 But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. That, that phrase in there I just put, that, that wasn't in the scripture. That's a little SKVB translation. Telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power. You say, well, I can't go talk to other people about Jesus. What do you think the Holy Spirit has been given to you for? I can't, I can't testify to other people. I'm shy. I just don't do that. That's not me. Get somebody else. You may be the only Jesus anybody will ever see and hear. And if you don't speak, who will? If we don't preach this message, who will? If we don't talk about freedom from our sins and freedom from our nature of sin to be all and everything for Jesus, if we don't do it, who will? The light, the light shines in the darkness and, and the light takes the darkness away. Acts 1.8. Let's go to 2 Peter 1, I think, 23 to 2 through 4. Yep. Apostle Peter, the, one of the disciples of Jesus, says this. His divine power has given us everything we need. I kind of had the feeling that Peter himself was thinking back to those days. Maybe 40, 50 years ago. However long it was that he experienced the dynamic empowering of the Holy Spirit in his life. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us the very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature 
having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And then finally, we are filled. If I were to be correct theologically, which I try to be, but not using all the words, but theologically, all four of these are what happens when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Just like when you were saved, when you were born again, there is regeneration, there's justification, there's forgiveness, there's repentance. So in the Spirit-filled life, these four things are given to us. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. He pours the heart of Jesus into every area of our life. Acts 2.4. And everyone present that was in the upper room, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them ability. You say, well, we can't have the very same things that they had on the day of Pentecost. And, and I get that. There, is an, there was an inauguration of the church and of the power that he was giving the church and those who were believers, those who were faithful followers. But Acts 15, 8, 9, that we said before, that is, to me, the key crux of everything that Apostle Peter was trying to get across and that Luke is trying to get across here. Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. They were purified. They were perfected of heart. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And finally, they were filled. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the Apostle Paul, who also experienced this baptism of the Holy Spirit on his way to Damascus, he wrote to the church at Ephesus. Now, the Ephesians were believers in Jesus. They were followers of Jesus. And, and it was the Apostle Paul who wanted these believers, these followers, to become faithful followers. And this is what he said. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine. Well, apparently, apparently uh, Paul had heard of what people were saying on the day of Pentecost. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, instead, this will make your life so much better. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. Wow, the, the music then gets turned up. The music, the words, the music, all that begin to make sense. And all of a sudden now, we're living in such a manner that everything, only what matters to Jesus is what matters to us. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to pray this morning, right where you're at. We'll just ask the worship team to stay where you're at right now. I want to pray. And I want you, if, if this, these last few weeks have meant, have spoken to you. I want to pray that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that you're going to we're going to feel the rushing wind through this place. I'm not going to say we're going to see cloven tongues of fire. I'm not going to say we're going to speak in languages that other people can't, can't hear, can't speak, that, that, that they speak. I want you to come to the place where you, by your faith, in what Jesus has taught us through his word, by faith, you are aware of this need in your life. You are aware that you are about to make a choice. And now, you have opportunity to, to respond. 
And when you respond by placing your faith in the work of the Holy Spirit through God's power, you can take the steps out of this nature of sin and into the light of the fullness of God's Spirit. If he has been talking to you, if he has made you aware of this, we come to a point of decision now. It's not that you haven't heard about it. It's not that you're, you know, it's, it's something that you haven't processed. I mean, there's a lot that maybe you don't understand, but at this point, now, you will be responsible of a right or wrong decision. And I ask that you would, you would be obedient and pray a prayer of faith to God saying, I want you, your spirit, to fill my life that I might become everything you want me to be. If you're there, Maybe you've heard it before, but you haven't made that conscious choice yet. If you're ready to make that decision, I want you to stand where you are so that I can pray with you. Just stand where you're at and say, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how to do it. I just know that I'm there now, and I want the Holy Spirit to fill me. If anyone is like that, I want you to stand. And I want to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to say who you are. I'm just, for those that stand, I want to pray. Anyone? Heavenly Father, you know the needs that are represented here. You know the vacillation in some people's lives. You know the arguments that they're putting up right now. You know that some are just, well, they're just, it's not time for them, they think. And maybe there are some here who just want to get to know you for the first time and make a decision to follow you. They want their sins to be forgiven. I don't know how you work. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how you're saying and speaking to people. And I know, Lord, we've been here a little long. But I sure don't want I sure want us to be able to have the rest of this day bring glory and honor to you by people making the choice to say, I, I will become a faithful follower. I will ask the Holy Spirit to cleanse my self-centeredness, my self-absorption, to cleanse my heart. to be obedient to everything that he leads me to do. It's in your holy, precious name, Lord Jesus, we pray.